Time travel, mysteries and secrets of voodoo. More with Lionel Fanthorpe. And now you, your phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. Lionel, tell us a little bit about Santeria now, which is part of your book, Mysteries and Secrets of Voodoo. Right. Well, the, the idea of that name, Santeria, it's extremely similar to the voodoo and the obeer, all these mystery religions. They're just slight variations. But the, the name, Santeria comes from the idea of having many saints. It's a derivation of that. And that takes us back to the the Orishas and Loas who got translated into the appropriate saints, like Peter and Martin and Anthony all became associated with Alagua, and Oya became associated with St. Catherine, because they both had uh, connections with storms. And the uh, the idea of them, I think what we need to to think about, to be fair to the practitioners, is that although we talked about curses and uh, some of the dark side, that very often what they offer to their uh, worshippers is uh, healing and uh, health in general and prosperity and uh, a good life and contentment and happy relationships. So that 90% of the aim of Santeria is to make people happy, to make people well. And so uh, on that, we have nothing but admiration for them. It's just that the public image, should we say the Hollywood image, um, it is of the, the voodoo with the voodoo curses and zombieism and people sticking pins into the, uh, the voodoo dolls to bring pain and distress to the victim. But for, um, for the great uh, majority of the time, Santeria especially, uh, is very benign and it aims to, to bring health and happiness. All right. To some of the phones we go, first-time caller line in Decatur, Alabama. Lewis, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hey, Lewis. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Good. Uh, hello. Um, earlier in the show, you made reference to um, deja vu and uh, astral projections. Yeah. Um, now, George, I'm about the same age as you, so this goes back away. When I was a sophomore in high school, there was a girl in my one of my classes that uh, claimed to have ESP, also that uh, she was a practicing witch. Um, we had several conversations on the topic, and for some reason she decided that she didn't believe that I believed. In other words, she didn't think I believed what she said. Um, so she set out to prove it to me. And one night I was laying in bed asleep, woke up with a start, wide awake. First thing out of my mouth was, Jan, I told you I believed you. Uh, next day in school, uh, she confronted me. She said, well, how did you like what happened last night? I said, hmm. well, what do you think about what I told you? And she repeated back to me exactly what I said. Um, they, now, this, this goes into what later happened. Um, I had been, I'd had some experience with ESP, and had started reading some of uh, Edgar Casey's work. Okay. And had tried to duplicate some of the things that were spelled out in the book, mainly astral projections and um, out-of-body experiences. I'd had a girlfriend that I was, you know, I, I felt like I was deeply in love with, and she broke up. Uh, tried to talk her into seeing me again, and after two or three phone conversations, she wouldn't answer my phone. And one night I went to sleep, and had a dream about her, woke up the next morning, um, no real recollection of the dream. But I tried again that afternoon to call her and got through. She answered the phone. And she was very shaken up. She said that uh, during the night she woke up and saw me at the foot of her bed. Uh, not only that, but she screamed and her mother came in the room and her mother saw me as well. And when she said that, it all came back to me, and I described her bedroom to her, to a T, never, had been, never having been in there. At least, so, at least physically. <laughs> at least physically, exactly. Um, I, 
Yeah, I think uh, that is extremely interesting, and I'd also say that in terms of astral projection, I think that the experiences you had uh, were valid, definitely. May I just tell you a story about Mrs. Turner? Now, she was the lady that uh, George and I were talking about earlier, who was the American lady who married the Englishman named Turner, and had apparently been doing astral projection to the house in England that they eventually bought. Now, this same lady seems to have had an amazing gift for astral projection. And I think this is one of the things that varies with one human being to another, just as there are some mediums who appear to be extremely perceptive and to have very accurate powers. And just as uh, there are some people who have uh, other psychic powers that they can sense things or they have presentiments so that our astral projection powers again tend to vary and mrs turner as she became had very very strong powers of projection the story concerned uh, after she was married and living happily in the house that she had visited astrally from the states she had a terrible nightmare. She was uh, in bed with her husband, and suddenly, in her sleep, as it were, she got out of bed, stood beside the window. He's watching her in, uh, you know, in some alarm and anxiety, and she is waving her arms and shouting, "Go back! Go back!" And then he leads her gently back into bed, and they go back to sleep. Now, in the morning. She told him that she had had this terrible dream, as she felt it to have been, in which she was standing on the top of a cliff, below which were jagged rocks, and a storm was blowing, lightning was flashing, and she could see a sailing ship coming towards the rocks, which would have uh, wrecked it and drowned the passengers and crew. And that's why she was in her dream screaming and waving her arms, get back, get back. And their brother-in-law turned up. He was in the Navy. He turned up two or three months later when he got back from a voyage and said, I'm very lucky to be here. Hmm. He said, we were heading for the rocks in a terrible storm when a woman in a white long dress, like a nightdress, appeared on the top of the cliff and screamed at the top of her voice, and we heard her above the storm, and as the lightning lit the scene, we could see the rocks, and we missed them by a matter of fate. He said, without her, we would be dead. And she turned back her diary, held it out to her brother-in-law, and said, was that when you were there? And it was the night that she'd had the nightmare of the ship crashing on the rocks without realizing that her brother-in-law was one of those aboard. Man, can you tell a story? Travis in Birmingham, Alabama, you're on with us. Hi there. Hey, I, I just wanted to talk about uh, Wade Davis and the uh, zombies. Have you ever heard of him? I have not. How about you, Lionel? Wade no, Davis? Not, not by that name. I'd love to hear more about what, it. What, what is he it, He was Travis? a Harvard ethnobotanist that went to Haiti in uh, 1982. Okay. And uh, he spent Two or three years there, uh, researching the uh, zombies, and he ended up uh, getting in contact with a Bocor and studied with him for about a year and a half of that three years. And uh, from the powders that he was given, which he was told made zombies, there was a tetrodotoxin from the fugu fish, the puffer fish. Right. And the chura was in it, which has uh, hallucinogens in it. And, so, and the tetrodotoxin is being researched today for, uh, to be a powerful painkiller. Right. Uh, and so that was the, the things he found that were said to be causing the zombies. And then the boat corps told him they used uh, just the detura, the detura paste or whatever. After they had been given that formula to make them seem as if they were dead, then they were given detura to control and, them. And he field. wrote a book called The Serpent and the Rainbow, didn't he? Yes, he did. He did, yeah. And it was about his research there. That's right. He's an anthropologist and uh, spent a lot of time in Haiti. Yeah, that's yeah. exciting. And he worked for Harvard. 
Yeah, that is extremely interesting, and it does um, rather go along with the basic ideas that uh, I suggested, that it is a form of toxin. And I go right back to the, uh, the, the Shakespearean Romeo and Juliet situation with Father Lawrence trying to use it.